I will be speaking today about the neurobiology of sleep. And so here's, um, here's my basic outline. Uh, you know, what I want to do is touch on basic sleep physiology a little bit. Um, you all may know some of this already, but we'll start at the beginning. Uh, nonetheless, in case there's some holes in your understanding of sleep, uh, uh, basic sleep physiology. We'll talk about circadian rhythms because that's a crucial element of uh, human sleep and sleep neurobiology. Then we'll get into the nitty gritty of the, the brain and where things are and the things that matter in, in regards to sleep. Then kind of boil it down to this notion of sleep and wake being a flip-flop switch, which is uh, a crucial uh, ability to kind of fall asleep quickly and, and wake up quickly. And then I want to put it all together to describe what I think is the quintessential sleep disorder, which is narcolepsy. So kind of how this neurobiology informs our understanding of narcolepsy. And then uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. So this is a fascinating study done a number of years ago by one of the leaders in our field, Alan Rechtstoffen. And essentially what you can see here is you have two rats on a platform. Now this platform is actually, consider it to be in a big barrel of water, all right? And you have, you're measuring the EEG of each rat. So you have the brown rat here, you have the white rat there. Um, but the, the white rat is the experimental rat. And what we mean by that is that every time that this rat began to fall asleep, you know, when we're looking at the EEG, this platform would rotate uh, 360 degrees and knock both of these rats into the water. They would then obviously have to be awake, swim around, find the platform, get back on it. So the, the white rat here was in a total sleep deprivation experiment. And the brown rat was in a partial sleep deprivation experiment because they could possibly be asleep or be awake when they were knocked off. And the bottom line is that you can see, um, you know, over time that uh, the rat that had a total sleep deprivation paradigm, you know, its plasma thyroxine levels got out of whack. It couldn't control its, its body temperature anymore despite increased caloric intake it um, began to have issues with uh, weight loss and uh, subsequently uh, died approximately three to four weeks after the initiation of this experiment. So this is, is kind of like the classic experiment, you know, indicating that sleep is necessary for life. And if you totally sleep deprived an animal, they will die. Is that a CIA experiment? I mean, that's, yeah. that seems incredibly cruel. <laughs> yeah, that's... you know, you could probably back in the day, some of the neurosurgery residents, you know, came <laughs> close to this. Yes, I think that's what we did. Exactly. Some people on this call can probably relate relate to this. Although I think you, you guys are, are you know, self-selected for ability to withstand severe sleep deprivation, but that's a topic for another talk. Yes, yes. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> that's all right. All right, so these are the stages of sleep that we all go through at night. We enter sleep in stage one, or N1s, uh, where you can see you get a low voltage mixed frequency EEG. Chin tone is still high. This is going to make up 5 to 10% of your night. Then we would typically go into stage N2, where you can see 14 hertz sleep spindles here and some of these K complexes is what we call these, these uh, uh, big waves here. Um, this is gonna make up about 50% of your night. And then stage N3, ostensibly the most important sleep stage where you get these delta waves booming through here. You can see through all these sleep stages, the chin muscular tone is, is fairly high. This uh, stage N3 is going to make up about 20% of your night. And when you're sleep deprived, this is the stage that your body is going to want to get back uh, first. This is where growth hormone is secreted. This is an important sleep stage for body health. Uh, and then you have this stage REM, which is going to be about 20% of your night. Here you can see you got um, this mixed frequency uh, EEG, what we consider sawtooth waves, uh, kind of like looking like a saw right there. Um, these this, uh, uh, electrodes are near the eyes, so you can see what we call rapid eye movements, either looking a, a, uh, to the left or the right. And then chin tone is dropped out, and I'll talk more about this in a, a little bit later, 
Um, but that's a crucial element of REM sleep is that, um, y- you know, your, your uh, muscular tone is, it, you lose that. So there's stage N1, N2, N3, that's non-REM sleep. That's about 80%. Stage REM is separate. That's about 20%. Um, and so that's the basic uh, kind of sleep architecture that, w- that we look for when we look at a sleep study. And so this is just kind of unpacking that a little bit more here. But, you know, when we're o- awake, um, we have our sympathetic tone is variable. Our EEG will look like this. Um, when we're in non-REM sleep, we're kind of unconscious or we could still have some bland thoughts, even in stage N1. Our sympathetic tone gets lower. So as we enter sleep, our body temperature goes down. Our respiratory rate goes down. Our heart rate um, goes, goes down. Uh, here you see some of those uh, uh, big delta waves that we talked about before. And, um, you know, this does gradually decrease across adulthood. And then in REM sleep, of course, that's where we do most of our dreaming, but you can dream in other sleep stages. And here, um, heart rate can go up or become more variable. Temp- uh, Temperature is not affected so much, but respiratory rate goes up because you, you start to breathe as if you're in your dream. And then there's the EEG again. So these aspects of changes in respirations, changes in heart rate and heart rate variability, these are the things that some of these consumer sleep technologies that you all are probably using actually leverage in order to measure your sleep in home, in the home environment, you know, the, um, the act, uh, Fitbits and, and things like that. So here's a hypnogram. Um, this shows kind of the, how we progress through sleep throughout the night. So as I mentioned before, we're going to, of course, be awake when we first put our head on the pillow. Then we go into N1, N2, N3. Then we may come to have a little bit of dreaming sleep, and then we'll go. So this is, this is an ultradian rhythm here. And I think the takeaway that I want you to appreciate is that this N3 is front-loaded and REM is back-loaded in, your, nor, in a normal sleep period throughout the course of the night. This is why you might you know, remember your dreams upon awakening in the morning because you're waking up out of REM sleep. And then again, you know, N3 is so important that your body gets to it as soon as it can. There are other things in your body that have ultradian rhythms, uh, such as growth hormone secretion in your circulation. And we'll talk a little bit more about circadian rhythms uh, later. Well, actually, right now. So, um, you know, there's, so there's this two-process model of sleep. And, and one process is process C, or the circadian timing of sleep. So when we're awake during the day, uh, it's light out. The light uh, is perceived by our retinas. There's special myelinopsin containing cells in our retinas that stimulate this retinohypothalamic tract. This goes back to um, stimulate the suprachiasmatic nucleus uh, here by the optic chiasm. And this is the, in, the body's uh, master clock or master pacemaker, okay? And then uh, this master pacemaker has you know, multiple synaptic connections throughout the brain and brain stem to control kind of when we're awake and, and when we're asleep. And so let me move on to this next slide, which I think kind of shows it in a little better detail. So here's the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the master clock. So then it, that has projections through the, the dorsal and ventral subparaventricular zone back to this dorsomedial nucleus of the hypothalamus. And this is a crucial nucleus here because this, this is where it's going to integrate these light dark patterns and then send out projections to uh, the median uh, medial preoptic area to control body temperature, the ventrolateral preoptic uh, area to control sleep. And this is in the anterior hypothalamus, this VLPO. This is a crucial thing to remember from this talk. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, And then to the paraventricular nucleus for corticosteroid release. And then lastly, to the lateral hypothalamic area, which can control some wakefulness and feeding. And so, you know, this DMH is really kind of integrating the circadian rhythmicity of all of these uh, elements here. And it also has projections that are stimulated by leptin and ghrelin. Now, this is tells us whether we're satiated after eating or if we're hungry And so this just goes to show you that your brain has the ability to adjust 
your level of wakefulness depending on when food is available. So, you know, if you were a nocturnal animal and your nocturnal food source all of a sudden went away and you had to feed during the day, your brain could adapt to that. So, um, so that's process C. Uh, it's, it, it's basically the alerting process uh, throughout the day. So sunlight is stimulating that master clock and that's what's through this uh, multiple projections is keeping you awake during the day. Now we have process S, which is this homeostatic drive. And that's simply the notion that the longer you're awake, the greater your drive to sleep. And we think it's probably the buildup of adenosine in the brain uh, in the median preoptic area. And so as your body um, you know, consumes ATP uh, to ADP to AMP, ultimately you end up with adenosine. And so this adenosine is building up and it's, it's kind of building up this homeostatic sleep drive here. Okay, so these two things are opposing each other, right? Because, you know, this, pro this uh, need to go to sleep is increasing, of course, uh, across the day. And if the circadian alerting signal did not also increase, you wouldn't be able to stay awake, you know, later in the day here. And so that's, these two opposing forces are pushing on each other, um, you know, throughout your, the 24-hour day. Now, um, there is actually a natural dip in the circadian alerting signal around two or three in the afternoon. So this is where, you know, the line to get coffee is, uh, is the longest. It's not a postprandial thing. It's a natural part of your process C. Um, and so these two things are opposing each other throughout the day. But what happens is when it gets dark out, uh, the retinohypothalamic tract no longer stimulates the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That suprachiasmatic nucleus during the day had been inhibiting the pineal gland from secreting melatonin. So that inhibition is released. Melatonin is secreted. Melatonin further inhibits the circadian alerting signal, and then you're able to fall asleep fairly quickly. And so this is why it's important that we sleep when it's dark out and we're awake when it's light out and why it's such a struggle when we try to do it the, you know, backwards or the other way around. Talked about circadian rhythms. Um, just so you know, there, are, there is circadian rhythmicity to nearly all the cells in your body. And this is how this is, is driven. So this is a transcriptional translational feedback loop. So you have BMAL1 in clock, which forms this heterodimer, which turns on these E-box elements to produce the transcription of these clock genes. So that's period, cryptochrome, and then clock genes here. Now, as those get uh, translated and build up in the cell, they go back to inhibit uh, BMAL and clock heterodimer to reduce their own production. So this is just kind of, you know, what's happening inside individual cells. We have clock genes within individual cells, which are controlling their circadian rhythmicity. So there really is, uh, you know, it's really a whole body process, not just in the brain related to sleep and wake. All right, so let's get more into the neurobiology here. And this is kind of a little footnote on history, but there was a Viennese neurologist back in 2016, or excuse me, in, in uh, 1916, 1917, who began to notice people after they would get some kind of, they'd have a viral illness, they were developing either problems with excessive sleepiness or the inability to sleep. And uh, he did detailed neuropathological studies and showed that it, those that were having uh, excessive sleepiness had lesions in their dorsolateral hypothalamus, and those that were having trouble um, uh, falling asleep had uh, lesions in their anterior hypothalamus. And so it was really interesting because this is way ahead of its time, because what we've subsequently learned is that these really are the areas of the brain that are crucial to sleep and wake. And so let's go through this here. Um, it, you know, as we think about the awake brain, okay, so here, you know, these are all the, the areas in the brain and the monoaminergic systems that are firing and turned on while we're awake. And so you have the uh, uh, noradrenergic locus ceruleus, you have the serotonergic raphe, you have the dopaminergic ventral tegmental area, the histaminergic tuberomammillary nucleus. You have the acetylcholinergic uh, peduncular bontine and lateral dorsal tegmental nuclei back here. 
Um, you have the parabrachial nucleus, which is glutamatergic. And then uh, this here at the basal forebrain is, is cholinergic. So, you know, all those neurotransmitters are involved and all of these areas are crucial to maintaining normal wakefulness. As you all listen to my talk right here, they all have projections to the, the cortex at large. Um, then there's this crucial additional element here, which is called orexin. So this is about 70,000 cells in the dorsolateral hypothalamus. Now, orexin is a neuropeptide. It's also called hypocretin-1 because two groups discovered it at the same time in 1999, and they both named it something different. So just, you know, we have to remember both of those things. Some people call this neuropeptide orexin. Some people call it hypocretin-1. Um, but what this does is this is kind of like a wake stabilizer. So this has projections to all these monoaminergic areas and choliner acetylcholinergic areas to kind of like stabilize wakefulness throughout the, the course of the day. And, uh, and so it's crucial to our ability to stay awake. All right. So then, you know, we enter sleep in non-REM sleep, as I mentioned before, non-REM stage one. So we can consider this to be the, the beginnings of the sleepy brain or the sleeping brain. And what you see here is, is what I mentioned before, the ventrolateral and median preoptic nuclei here in the anterior hypothalamus. This starts to come online and subsequently blocks all of these, these areas, these monoamines and the, these uh, cholinergic areas that were crucial to wakefulness. Uh, and then you also has, have basal forebrain projections to the cortex. So, so you can see, you know, what it, what's thought is occurring is that you have buildup of adenosine around the median preoptic nucleus. This turns on the, the VLPO, and then it starts to block these wakeful areas, and that allows us to, to fall asleep. And, and there has been studies in animal models injecting adenosine into area, regions of the brain near this. Uh, and that that has um, uh, created uh, or, or uh, precipitated sleep in these animals. And then I mentioned REM sleep. I don't want to get into the exact details of this too much, but just to say, as I mentioned before, our body, our muscle tone drops out. Our body becomes paralyzed in REM sleep. And, and that occurs mostly through this sublateral dorsal nucleus here, which sends glutamatergic projections to the ventromedial medulla to stimulate it, which then sends GABAergic and glycinergic projections to hyperpolarized spinal motor neurons and cause paralysis. Now, we're paralyzed in REM sleep for obvious reasons. That way, we don't act out our dreams and injure ourselves or other people. Now, there is a disease called REM sleep behavior disorder where, where this uh, fails and uh, people can injure themselves and bed partners. And this is typically associated with neurodegenerative uh, diseases like alpha-synucleinopathies, um, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease, um, multiple system atrophy, and things like that. Uh, and, uh, and also it can be seen in, in narcolepsy uh, can have this REM sleep behavior disorder. So just kind of you know, letting you know about that uh, disease that's, that's out there. When we see it, we do get concerned. It's, it's often a preclinical marker of these neurodegenerative diseases, unfortunately, uh, but it can occur idiopathically and it can be precipitated by the use of uh, SSRIs. Um, so, we, and so we do see it as a medication side effect as well. So just to kind of summarize, that was a lot of dense information, but if there's a handful of things to remember from this, it's really, you know, the, the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus and the median preoptic nucleus and the anterior hypothalamus, which promotes sleep. Then you have these wake areas that we discussed and, and their corresponding uh, neurotransmitters. And then lastly, wake stabilization in the dorsolateral hypothalamus, orexin, aka hypocretin, is this crucial neuropeptide. So I want to talk about this sleep-wake switch. Obviously, it would be uh, detrimental to human health and development if it took us a long time to wake up after sleep was finished or it took us a long time to fall asleep. Now, of course, you know, sleep disorders like insomnia and, and narcolepsy and things like that can cause these things. But for a normally functioning human being, 
you know, we want these things to happen fairly quickly. So here, when we're awake, we have that circadian alerting signal I talked about, retinal hypothalamic tracts, you know, sunshine hits the eye, retinal hypothalamic tract, you have the, uh, you have the alerting signal coming from the suprachiasmatic nucleus, that's suppressing melatonin secretion from the pineal gland and kind of, you know, has to you awake. It pushes the thumb on the scale of the teeter-totter here to be, have you be awake. All of these monoaminergic systems are turned uh, online. This blocks the VLPO and MNPO. And then orexin is like a finger on the switch stabilizing it in, in wakefulness, okay? Then it gets dark out the circadian alerting signal is reduced. The melatonin is allowed to be secreted from the pineal gland, which is going to further inhibit the suprachiasmatic nucleus alerting signal. And you have a buildup of adenosine in the VLPO. Sleep then is promoted. The finger kind of pushes the teeter-totter up on this side. VLPO, MMPO are activated. They block these monoamines, and they also block uh, orexin, and sleep is allowed to occur. So that's that flip-flop switch. Okay, so now that we've talked about the neurobiology of sleep, circadian rhythms, and things like that, I want to kind of discuss it in the context of what I think is the quintessential sleep disorder, which is narcolepsy. And so, you know, this is a disease of, of excessive sleepiness. If you're not sleepy, you can't have this disease cataplexy, which is sudden reversible loss of skeletal muscle tone. Um, then you have hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations where you may, people may uh, see or hear things that aren't theirs. They're falling asleep or waking up. And that can be visual. I mean, that can be somesthetic and be a sense of levitation. It can be lots of different sensations. Sleep paralysis, so waking up unable to move, and then automatic behavior, going about your day and doing things like, uh, say, putting dishes in the refrigerator or, um, you know, or doing strange behaviors like that. So cataplexy is uh, really the major symptom of what we call type 1 narcolepsy. And that, uh, you know, can be as subtle as drooping of the head or some dysarthria, or it can be as dramatic as falling to the ground. And these are the, the different sites that, that it can um, affect. So what's happening there is it's really interesting. You have sudden positive emotions. So it usually be like telling or hearing jokes. Uh, it would bring, uh, you know, it'd be, it would activate the medial prefrontal cortex, which in turn activates the central amygdala and the erexin producing cells in the dorsolateral hypothalamus. Now, we haven't really discuss this much yet, but in type one narcolepsy, these cells, like 90% of these cells are, are, have been killed off. And so it's an orexin or hypocretin one deficient state. So the amygdala uh, causes reduced activity in the ventrolateral periaqueductal gray and orexin would typically stimulate that, but it doesn't because it's not, it can't function in type one narcolepsy. So as a result, with this reduced activity, it doesn't block the sublateral dorsal tegmental nucleus very well. So you have increased activity of this. You have increased uh, inhibition ultimately of uh, motor neurons and you have this cataplexy during the day. So cataplexy is essentially the paralysis that's, that your body has when you're asleep to prevent you from acting out your dreams occurring during the day. Here's uh, just the, the EEG um, that would occur during a cataplectic attack. And, and again, mostly in the EMG, you can see drop out of muscle tone. Um, the EEG, you know, these individuals are awake. So if you, if you see this, they're going to hear everything you're saying while this attack is going on. Usually it's fairly self-limited, wouldn't last more than a brief minute or so. Um, if it lasts longer, it's called status cataplecticus, and that's a problem. So this is just a, a flow diagram telling you that yeah, telling and hearing jokes seems to be a major trigger. If you have symptoms with that, plus when you get angry, there's a 92% chance that this is true cataplexy. Let me show you this video, see if this will work, of a cataplectic attack, which, uh, you know, we don't get to see too often. You might recognize a young John Miller there on the side of the screen. So he's... so. 
you, you can see, yeah, that's a pretty substantial attack and the buckling of the knees. So the patients awake here, um, if, if they checked reflexes, there's transient reversible loss of deep tendon reflexes as well in a person with cataplexy. So it's pretty scary. You know, somebody having a cardiac arrest, um, you know, that would be in the differential diagnosis. So, you know, you can see they're making sure that she's o awake and, um, and okay. And uh, she's starting to come out of it. So it's fairly quick. And then, you know, she's trying to get back up and struggling with that a little bit too. They were telling some joke about a pumpkin patch. I is what the. All right, so, so that's cataplexy. That's in type one narcolepsy, um, and it's a it's really a crucial symptom. It won't occur in any other disease. Sleep paralysis is something that occurs actually in the general population. So it's it's common in narcolepsy, but also in, in about six percent of adults, and uh, it's associated with all of these factors here. It can be terrifying if it happens, you wake up, you can't move. Um, usually it would last less than a minute. And, and sometimes just being touched by another individual can kind of snap you out of it. And it's associated with sleep deprivation. If you've ever had this, you know, don't worry, you very likely don't have, it's just something that occurred um, maybe uh, during a period of sleep deprivation. Hallucinations, so we talked about this a little bit hypnagogic or hypnopompic happening when you fall asleep or when you wake up it can really express itself in multiple different ways. It's very common in narcolepsy, but can also occur in the general adult population. So some of us may have had that experience in our lives at some point. Uh, for narcolepsy, I want to make the point that sleep is, you think, oh, it's a disease of sleepiness. So um, their sleep is fine at night. Well, it's not. Uh, if you look here, this is again one of those hypnograms. This is a, a normal individual, and you can see they go to sleep. Uh, you know, they have a few awakenings during the night, but this is a normal progression through the various stages of sleep throughout the course of the night. Here's a patient with narcolepsy, lots of awakenings. It's almost like their sleep gets chopped up at night and spread out over the course of a 24 hour day. And so that it has that sleep wake uh, instability because orexin is deficient. So you don't have the finger on the switch anymore. So the switch can flop back and forth. And that's what's, what's going on here. Um, real quick, narcolepsy prevalence does change. It's different uh, across the world. It's highest in Japan. This is per 100,000 individuals. Um, 56, that's in Minnesota per 100,000, 47's in Germany. 40s in the UK, 34 in China. Will Longstreth has done some of the most important epidemiologic studies. Uh, he found a 31 per 100,000 in King County, 26 in Finland, 22 uh, in uh, Norway, 21 in Spain, 15 in South Korea, 4 in Saudi Arabia, and just 0.23 in Israel. So why is this? Well, um, we know that there is an HLA haplotype. Uh, DQB10602 that's associated with uh, type 1 narcolepsy, and that does vary according to uh, ethnicity across the world. And so that's probably why you have so much variability there. But one thing to appreciate, this isn't a rare disease. It's not as rare as you think it is. So if you compare the prevalence per 100,000, this is based on the Minnesota number, you know, it's about half of multiple sclerosis and a third of Parkinson's disease. So, um, you know, this is, this is out there. You, you probably will see it at some point. And as I mentioned for type one narcolepsy, essentially it's, it's just destruction of these, uh, orexin producing cells in the dorsolateral hypothalamus. So this is a normal individual, the stained cells here, and then you can see there's just a handful. So, you know, the disease expresses itself once like around 90% of these cells are destroyed. So it's kind of, unfortunately, um, the horse is out of the barn by the time you, you know that the disease has occurred. And if you check the orexin or hypocretin one in the CSF, um, which is something that you can do to make a diagnosis of this disease, 
uh, in somebody with typical cataplexy, it's, you know, less than uh, 110 nanograms per liter is, is basically what we're looking for. And you can see, even in people with typical cataplexy, there'll be some normals, but mostly at, you know, low CSF hypocretin. And then as you go to atypical cataplexy, there's, there's more of a mixture and then no cataplexy. Most of those individuals will have normal um, hypocretin levels. And that's the, here's the HLA antigen. So this is just a part of the antigen uh, uh, presentation to the immune system and really was the first indication that we may be dealing with an autoimmune disease with, uh, with narcolepsy. And you can see uh, if we look at percent of patients with this uh, HLA DQB1062 haplotype, it is mostly present in people with type 1 narcolepsy. That's narcolepsy with cataplexy. Type 2 narcolepsy is narcolepsy without cataplexy, but it's also present in the general population. So it's not really a diagnostic test. It's more something to give us a sense about what's the pathophysiology of this disease. So that brings me to this question, which is, is narcolepsy an autoimmune disease? And, you know, Will Longstreth did, in his study, he showed that individuals that had a history of streptococcal infection as a child had an increased risk of uh, narcolepsy. And so, um, you know, and then there's, so that's here. Uh, we also know that season of birth is associated. So if you're born in March, you have a higher risk. If you're born in September, you have a lower risk, a higher birth order. And we don't know why this is, but... Uh, there is a phenomenon called microchimerism. So when a woman has a child, some of the um, immune cells from that child actually live on in her body and can for many years afterwards. So if she has subsequent children, she has her own immune cells, that child's immune cells, and then her first child's immune cells, which could uh, uh, interact with the fetus and cause problems. Um, we mentioned the HLA association. There's anti-trib2 antibodies. Uh, this is a, a brain-related um, uh, phenomenon, and then a T-cell receptor alpha locus polymorphisms associated with the disease. And then, of course, we have this very targeted neuron destruction, which suggests molecular mimicry between an antigen that they were exposed to through infection that creates an immune response that then attacks these specific cells. And, um, and it has been shown to occur following vaccination. Uh, and this was during the uh, H1N1 um, uh, pandemic or epidemic back in 2010, I believe it was. In some Scandinavian countries and in China, they got a particular type of vaccine. There were individuals that developed narcolepsy as a result of this. And it's thought to be related to the way that the vaccines were produced because uh, it didn't occur with everybody that got vaccinated. And then the other detail is some people that got the disease and didn't get vaccinated in China developed narcolepsy as well. So, um, you know, this is a forest plot looking at all those various studies showing that this, this in fact did happen. So just uh, talk a little bit about how we specifically diagnose narcolepsy here. Uh, you know, we, we use this international classification of sleep disorders criteria. We look for cataplexy and these other symptoms I mentioned, the hallucination, sleep paralysis, automatic behavior. We do a multiple sleep latency test, which is basically uh, during the day, it's four or five 20 minute naps where we're measuring one, how quickly you fall asleep. And two, once you fall asleep, do you go into REM sleep within 15 minutes? And if you go into REM sleep within 15 minutes, that's called a sleep onset REM. And if that occurs twice, and that's diagnostic of this disease. And then the CSF or Rexin, as I mentioned before, it's a little bit difficult to get that done. It's a send out test to Mayo. Um, so it, it, it can be done, but we don't do it here uh, in our laboratory medicine uh, area. One thing to understand is the, there's a big delta between symptom onset and diagnosis in this disease. And this disease would typically uh, initially express itself in adolescence. Uh, so, you know, the more we know about it, the more we understand it, the less likely we are to uh, miss this diagnosis. So for narcolepsy type 1, you got to have sleepiness for three months. Cataplexy, we talked about that. You got to fall asleep within eight minutes on the, those 
four to five naps, and then have those two sleep onset REMs. Um, if you have a sleep onset REM on a sleep on an overnight sleep study the night before your MSLT, that can count for one of the sleep onset REMs during the nap test. So we always do a nighttime PSG the night before to make sure people slept enough and rule out sleep apnea before doing the MSLT. And then you can also do the send out CSF test if you want. Narcolepsy type two, you're sleepy for three months and you have the same um, you know, MSLT requirements, cataplexy is absent. And if you tested their CSF erection, it would be normal. So there's a thinking that, you know, narcolepsy type one is like pure narcolepsy. It's the autoimmune narcolepsy and narcolepsy type two may be a different disease altogether. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of debate in sleep medicine about that fact, but they both, both diseases do have these sleep onset REMs on this NAP test. So, and we treat them the same way. Uh, this is just talking about the multiple sleep latency test and showing you that um, you know, specific tests rule in diseases, right? And so, um, you know, if you have the two sleep onset RAMs and you fall asleep in less than eight minutes, you have a specificity of 95% and a sensitivity of 78%. So you have the best combination of sensitivity and specificity with uh, those stipulations. So for, as far as treatment is concerned, um, you know, of course, we want a regular sleep schedule, good sleep hygiene. Napping does help. So brief 10, 15, 20-minute naps. Uh, typically, um, you schedule them throughout the day. That can be very beneficial. Uh, we want them to avoid uh, driving uh, in general. But if we treat them appropriately, some people with this disease can drive. And then we address the sleepiness and cataplexy. And sometimes, as I mentioned, they'll have problems with insomnia as well. So here's the, the list of therapies. So modafinil and armodafinil, these are wake-promoting agents. Uh, these are, are really first-line treatments. They're basically just a, 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 an enantomer of one another uh, if you go back to your chemistry. So it's, they're the same compound. They're just like mirror images of each other. And um, you know they both have the same efficacy, essentially. Patolosant, something that just came out uh, about a year ago, uh, this is uh, basically increases histaminergic transmission in the brain and treats both sleepiness and cataplexy. So this is a, a, a nice medication, um, also called Wakex. Sodium oxabate, um, this is also called Zyrem. This is uh, based on gamma hydroxybutyrate. And this is something you drink. It's a salty solution you drink before you go to bed and then you wake up four hours later to take another dose. It's quite effective at helping people with that might have sleep disturbance at night. It treats cataplexy. It treats sleepiness. It's a nice medication. Um, we also, you know, people are developing single dose uh, sodium oxabate and low sodium sodium oxabate. So there are other options that are, are coming. Solreamphetol is called uh, also called Sinosi, and this is a, a pretty powerful uh, stimulant at between 75 and 150 milligrams. And so that's a first line therapy. Methylphenidate and amphetamines we've used traditionally, even though there's not a ton of data on them, of course, you know, we have lots of clinical experience and we know that it's effective. And then, uh, you know, antidepressants are good treatments for cataplexy. In particular, venlafaxine or Effexor is a good cataplexy treatment that can be relatively inexpensive. So just kind of run through this a little bit here for the amphetamines, you have th this breaks open the vesicular monoamine transporter and the presynaptic bouton here. So it pushes dopamine out into the cleft. So that's how that works. Methylphenidate and modafinil prevent reuptake of dopamine. Solreamphetol is a norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Patolosan is a bit more complex. It's called an uh, antagonist slash inverse agonist but again, ultimately increases histaminergic uh, neurotransmission. And then sodium oxabate or Zyrem just kind of shuts down dopamine transmission overnight. So it helps build up dopamine stores uh, to be released during the day. And then as far as cataplexy is concerned, 
Venlafaxine, I mentioned that. So that's a serotonin, serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Of course, the traditional SSRIs like fluoxetine are, uh, inhibit serotonin reuptake. Tricyclic antidepressants are mostly serotonin and norepinephrine, but to a lesser extent, dopamine reuptake inhibitors. And then atom, atomoxetine isn't available, so we won't talk about that. And we already talked about sodium oxabate. So uh, in conclusion here, we talked about sleep physiology. We talked about sleep being necessary for life. That classic Rechtstoffen study showed that total sleep deprivation of the rat resulted in weight loss, uh, poor thermoregulation, and death. Talked about non-REM sleep and REM sleep. Non-REM's 80%, REM's 20%. Non-REM's made up of N1, N2, and N3. N3, growth hormone secreted, may be the most important sleep stage because that's the one you recoup first when you go back to, to sleep. REM is the sleep stage where you do your dreaming. It's probably most important for memory consolidation. We talked uh, about circadian rhythm. So the two process model of, of sleep, you have your circadian alerting signal. That's your suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is stimulated by light. That suppresses melatonin secretion from the pineal gland, keeps you awake during the day. Um, that's the process C. Process S is the longer you're awake, the greater your drive to sleep, probably a buildup of adenosine in the brain. And that as it gets dark out, melatonin secretion suppression is released, melatonin comes out, helps you fall asleep. Then we focused on, you know, all the monoaminergic systems that keep you awake during the day. And, uh, and then the VLPO and MNPO in the anterior hypothalamus, which put you asleep. And so you have this kind of teeter-totter flip-flop switch that orexin or hypocretin is the finger on the switch that allows state stability. And that in narcolepsy, you, that switch gets un, unstable. And so you get a lot of back and forth between sleep and wake in those individuals. And then talked a bit about narcolepsy as narcolepsy type one is a hypocretin deficient disease or orexin deficient disease. It's an autoimmune disease. It's targeted uh, destruction via molecular mimicry of these specific cells in the dorsolateral hypothalamus. Uh, and that, that um, uh, it, it, you know, results in cataplexy along with the sleepiness and, you know, some sleep paralysis, hypnagogic, hypnopompic hallucinations, and talked about type 2 narcolepsy, which is possible it's a different disease. It doesn't have cataplexy. It doesn't show typically destruction of hypocretin producing neurons, and, uh, uh, but nonetheless still produces substantial sleepiness and is associated with sleep onset REM periods on that daytime nap test or multiple sleep latency test. And so with that, I, I think we're right at uh, 45 minutes here. So thank you so much for your attention. Again, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to your group and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, this was uh, terrific. And I'm a little embarrassed because uh, I didn't realize how complex this was. <laughs> Uh, my question to you, I have two questions to you. I, I'm a little shocked uh, because commercially, you know, what do we do? We give people melatonin. It ain't that simple, is it, uh, in terms of getting people to sleep? Uh, and I understand uh, uh, I understand its relationship to supraventricular uh, nucleus and all that. Um, so tell me how important melatonin is on all these different, I mean, it's really just a tiny piece of this whole thing, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's interesting. I mean, melatonin is probably, it's just as important to setting our circadian rhythms as it is to, to initiating sleep onset. Um, and so it's uh, typically when, you know, we use it, we use it a lot to treat circadian rhythm sleep disorders like delayed sleep phase syndrome, where somebody may have a bedtime that's way later and a wake time that's way later than is kind of, uh, it, that prevents them from functioning in, in society. And so melatonin can help advance a bedtime if you give it a couple of hours before an intended bedtime. Um, it, we know that like shift workers have reduce secretion of melatonin during the day, they're not sleeping at night, and that, you know, melatonin has uh, uh, anti-carcinogenic uh, properties. 
melatonin as a sedative hypnotic is, is kind of a mixed bag. Um, it seems to work in some people and not others. Uh, my general recommendation would be, first of all, you don't need much of it. So if you're a mel taking melatonin, a milligram is more than enough. You don't need to get five and 10 milligrams. Um, and, uh, you know, typically, again, we, we recommend it's taken not like at bedtime, but an hour or two before bedtime. And then there are some medications, uh, Remelteon and Tazimelteon, which are uh, melatonin receptor agonist medications, actually. So Remelteon is an insomnia treatment that has variable efficacy. And Tazimelteon is a medication that treats non-24. So that's like in blind individuals where they have a free, like a, a, a free running circadian rhythm. It helps set a circadian rhythm. You may have seen ads for non-24 and that's Tazi Melteon. So, so I think, you know, the sleep community has been interested in these melatonin receptors and have, have developed medications with variable efficacy uh, that stimulate those receptors. One last question. I apologize because I find this so fascinating. Blue light, does that entrail sleep? Because yeah. you, know, you go on planes and they put on this blue light. And I've always understood that its relationship to causing the cyclic AMP uh, to cause serotonin to become melatonin. Is that correct or not correct? Yeah, that, that is, that is correct. And um, it really is interesting, uh, Rich, that, the, you know, blue light is like the, the light, you know, it's the light of all the clocks. And like you say, it's on planes and everything. And in many ways it is, you know, blue wavelengths of light, you know, stimulate, that suprachiasmatic nucleus, that alerting, awakening signal, the mo most robustly of all wavelengths. And so, you know, that's why kind of general recommendations for people with insomnia, people in general, but if you don't have insomnia, you know, it's, it's okay. But if, if you have insomnia is to not expose yourself to blue wavelengths uh, within an hour or two of bedtime. So like, for instance, on your iPhone, you, there's something called, I think it's called night watch. Nighttime, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that you might, you notice when you turn it on, which is a good thing, but then your phone turns kind of a yellowish color uh, at night. And so that's, that's blocking those blue wavelengths. And then the other thing for shift workers, 20% of the world are shift workers. We recommend they wear blue wavelength light blocking sunglasses when they leave the workplace in the morning, which helps facilitate their ability to go home and sleep during the day. And just so you know, it's brown tinted sunglasses are the best sunglasses at blocking uh, blue wavelengths of light. Oh, wow. F very complex, fascinating questions out there. And they're in the chat box. Let's look at our first chat. No, that's just a uh, Sam Brown. What is the relationship between sleep, bulk flow of CSF and dementia? Reduce CSF turnover is linked to dementia. Wow, I didn't know that, Sam. A great question. And this is one of the, I think, the most important discoveries in, uh, in sleep in the last five years. And actually, Jeff uh, Illiff at uh, the VA does a lot of research in this area. So there's something called the glymphatic system in our brain. So when we go to sleep, actually, our brain contracts just a little bit, and it opens up these uh, channels to allow CSF to kind of bathe the brain and individual cells to kind of flush out the byproducts of a day's worth of neurotransmission. And, um, you know, amyloid is, is one of those proteins that gets flushed out. And so, um, you know, we're beginning to learn that, you know, sleep deprivation. In fact, there's a study just the other day that showed that uh, sleep deprivation in midlife increased risk of dementing illness by about 30%. Uh, and so, you know, it, it is this, this slight contraction, this cleaning out, and almost like, you know, you, when you sleep, you almost like take out the garbage in your, your brain at night uh, with this glymphatic system uh, flow. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, between that, the epidemiology showing associations between sleep disorders and poor sleep and neurodegenerative diseases, I think, uh, you know, I've been convinced that um, there's a blockbuster drug out there that hasn't been discovered yet that can open up these channels. And, and uh, aquaporin is a, a, you know, a, a target uh, that, that could be important to, to kind of open the spigot on this system. But 
but yeah, I, I think that that really, uh, you know, drives home again, just the importance of sleep to a healthy brain uh, functioning and physiology as, as we age. That's great. That's great. Um, that's fascinating. So, uh, the next one is Nino Ramirez. I was waiting for Nino to Nino and Frank to talk. Great talk, Nate. You talked about the sleep wake switch. What do we know about the REM REM switch? And you know, Nate, you know Nino and Frank do some really stellar work, neurophysiology. So you want to pair with a great two great physiologists, neurophysiologists. There you go. Yeah, that thanks for that question. And it's interesting. So the, the pedunculopontine and the lateral dorsal tegmental nuclei, those cholinergic nuclei become activated in uh in REM sleep. So as we know, they're they're also activated during wake. <clears throat> and so um, you know, that has uh, we think part of the uh, element of stimulating dreaming during REM. <clears throat> And, and it's why REM, you know, the EEG in REM can sometimes look like the EEG in wakefulness. And, and it's easiest to wake up an individual out of REM, you know, compared to deep non-REM sleep. So, you know, REM is, is kind of a, an interesting mixture of some of those, um, you know, wakeful promoting regions and sleep promoting regions together. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a bit more complex than that, but, uh, but essentially it's, it's really these cholinergic systems that are, that are coming online and, and at that time, uh, you know, it's, it is, uh, fascinating because narcolepsy really is, you can be considered this notion of, you know, things that occur in REM sleep occurring during the day during wakefulness. So it's, it's like the creeping of REM sleep into wakefulness. So for instance, you know, the sleep paralysis. Uh, you know, you're awake, but you're paralyzed or the hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucinations. It's like you're having dreams, but you're awake uh, or the cataplexy is, is the paralysis of happening during, during emotion. So, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's that uh, kind of mixture of, of areas that, that produces REM. All right. That's, uh, that's interesting. Any other questions, anybody? Just uh, it, it, that's not in the chat. Um, this was um, this is really uh, this was great, Nate. I, I mean, again, I learned something. I got to sort it out a little. Um, uh, much more complex than I ever dreamed, and um, uh, this it, wonderful. Any residents? Any questions or um, anything related to something that? Uh, resonates with you my my young resident colleagues you know I, I would just like to say that um i hope this was helpful in the sense that it, you know as you're performing surgery on your patients it gives you some perspective of the areas that are particularly important well, to sleep and wake and um, and I'd be interested to know if, if any of you all have had uh, patients that, have, you know, following their surgeries had substantial problems in these areas. Well, that's so I'm listening to your talk, Nate. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Nate, we do surgeries in the, you, you know, in uh, on the eloquent cortex. I'm so my question is either one, we're not tracking them and don't ask them that question. In other words, why do more people not have sleep disorders? Or maybe they all do, and we don't know. And, you know, like most things in anatomy, remember, I mean, uh, you know, it, it really was studying um, the, the brain when a pike went through somebody's head back many years ago. We understood the brain better. Um, we do s selective destruction of the brain, not purposefully. Um, it would be interesting to study which patients have sleep disorders and which don't, don't you think, Nate? Oh, absolutely. I, I think, you know, the fact that this, this uh, you know, depending on how frequently you see it, um, if it's not that frequent, it would just speak to the resiliency of the brain in many ways uh, or, or this, and, and the skill of the surgeons that you have in your department. But, uh, you know, if there are opportunities to add some, if you have uh, pre-surgical questionnaires or things like that and ask a few questions about sleep, there may be an opportunity to look into this. But I'd be, you know, most 
concerned about any surgeries in and around the hypothalamus. Um, and, you know, of course, any, you're going to be really concerned about doing surgery in that area to begin with or, or the brainstem. But, you know, those are the, the areas that you can uh, maybe think a little bit more if you do surgery in those areas, ask your patients on follow up a couple of questions about sleep, because if they are having some issues, then maybe a referral to us in the sleep center would be appropriate. Well, well I, I'm thinking about that because third ventricular surgery, uh, beautiful surgery, but uh, somewhat rare, but not hydrocephalus in dilatation of the third ventricle and the hypothalamic nuclear. So, nucleus. so I, I'm going to talk to you a little more about that. I don't know if Dr. Williams is on the phone, but Diane Weisman, Weisman um, has a question. Is there a high incidence of dementia in surgeons secondary to sleep deprivation? Uh, has a study been done? Uh, I'm not aware of a study being done, you know, I, I think, of course, you know, it's, it's hard to extrapolate these large epidemiologic studies and what we know uh, about the glymphatic system in animal models to any given individual. But, um, uh, you know, and then, as I said earlier, I think, you know, surgeons, in particular neurosurgeons, self-select for, for individuals that can perform and, and, uh, and kind of are resistant to the effects of sleep deprivation. And I would imagine that resistance would would uh, translate to perhaps a, a the glymphatic system as well as your ability to remain awake and focused. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It's a great question, though. Yeah. Well. Um, it, it, yeah, uh, Diana, that's a great question. Well, I I'm thinking about two or three studies, Nate, I'm gonna to talk to you offline uh, in neurosurgical patients. This was just absolutely, uh, you exceeded my expectations yet again. I wanna thank you, Nate. The bad part about doing a good job every time you give a talk is that um, we get requests to get you back. So I think you're gonna just have to put on your, um, permanent every year you got to come back and talk to us maybe sometimes twice a year i think this is going to initiate some more people um, wanting to do research with you and um, uh, certainly have you back thank you nate really appreciate it my my pleasure and absolutely uh, happy to do it anytime and i i love speaking to your group